Okay, now I was inspired by Bobby Duke Arts to get down to the shore and see if I can find some rocks for crafting. Now, here on the Solent shore, we the rocks we have here are mostly flint, like this, and then very hard, very difficult to carve. I'm gonna okay, go. And also, when anything I pick up, Eva assumes is for her. However, in amongst all the flints, there are some other types of rock. There are some small pieces of limestone, and there are quite a few things which are man-made, which might also be quite good for carving. We're going to have a look and see if we can find some pieces of rock for crafting. Okay, so the only piece of carvable stone that I managed to find on the beach that day was this piece of slate. And it's it's curious to wonder where this slate might have come from, because slate is not native to this area. So I think it must have come from some man-made source. So it could have been a roof tile, but it does seem a little bit thick for a roof tile. I think it's part of a building, nevertheless, because there were bricks strewn all along that seashore there from a house that's probably um, fallen into the sea due to coastal erosion. So this is probably part of a building that's no longer there. Anyway, I've got a really cool idea for something we can make out of this slate, so that's going to come up in a future video quite soon now. So subscribe if you want to make sure you don't miss that. Okay, so if you've been following my Weird Stuff in a Can series, you may have seen me open and eat some of this the other day, which is fried mackerel with chilli. And it was interesting. It was quite tasty, but it was really pretty grim to look at in the can. I bought these up in Chinatown, I think, when I was up in London a couple of weeks back. And I had to buy a twin pack because this was wrapped together in cellophane. Two cans of this for pound eighty-nine or something like that. Uh, now, question is what to do with the second can? I really think opening one can was probably enough for me and I've got to move on to the next thing anyway. So anyway, Paul from PJ Play contacted me in the comments and said, hey, I'd like to try it. So I'm sending this off to you for you to try. Um, maybe you'd like to post a video of your reaction when you open it. If you want to check out Paul's channel, there's links in the video description below. First video I stumbled across was the five ingredient McDonald's challenge, which I won't spoil for you, but it's well worth a watch. So. Coming your way, Paul, and thanks for your support on my channel. So we went down to Botley Church Fair today, and there was a lot of little stalls there with uh, interesting things for sale. Pickles, chutneys, plants, a nice tombola where we won a couple of interesting bottles, and a honey stall run by Sue, who's a friend of mine. Um, and so I bought myself this jar of ivy honey. Now, I've never had ivy honey before now. In fact, I have had a lot of different named honeys, and when you have orange blossom honey or heather honey or whatever, it's supposed to have quite a distinctive taste. I've got to say that often when I buy specific flower honey, I can, it's nice, but I can't really tell what is different about it. It's just honey. However, I had a little taste of this while I was down there, but I'm going to have another little taste of this one now. So this is ivy honey. This is honey that the bees have made from ivy flowers. So I'm going to have a little taste of it now so that I can tell you what it's like. Now this is really, really crystallised and I did pick a jar that was very heavily crystallised because I love honey that's really hard and crunchy and crystallised. It's just the way I like it, actually. I'm just going to taste this now. And it's incredible. It really is incredible. It's the most fragrant and floral honey that I think I've ever eaten. It's got a flavour that is like one of those really powerful tropical sort of flowers. Really amazing. So yes, this uh, this is quite a eye-opener really, this, this honey. You would think ivy, being a relatively boring plant, would have a boring flavour. But ivy honey is just quite amazing. 
Mm. Incredible aroma. So I'm thinking that maybe I ought to do this justice, this honey, and maybe I ought to make some mead. What do you think? I thought it might be interesting just to revisit the little water meadow that I featured in several videos earlier this year from springtime onwards. We're going to walk through the opposite direction today because it's the winter sun is very low and we'd be just looking into the sun if we went through the regular direction. So I'm walking through in reverse this time. Well, I'm walking forwards but from the opposite end. So here we come to a little pond that has a thin layer of ice on it. So that's how cold it was last night and as you can see there's a little crust of frost on all of the leaves. I'm expecting that the meadow will actually be quite cold and frosty because it's a low-lying area so the cold air will have spilled into this natural depression and settled here. So yes, there is a thick crust of frost on all the grass. <laughs> Eva's not really sure what to do about that. She's never seen snow and only twice in her life, I think, seen frost. So uh, this is quite an exciting event for her. Go on, go and explore. This must be quite an exciting sensation for her. She doesn't really know how to interpret it. Everything is covered with a crystalline crust of frost. Now when we get round to the bit where the sunlight is falling on the leaves, I think we're going to find that that looks rather magical, at least on the bits that haven't melted yet. So look, let's have a talk about what we can see now. It's late autumn, so it's, well, it's actually late November. So we're heading off into winter now, and nearly everything is dormant now. So most of the trees have lost most of their leaves, and all of the herbaceous plants are dying down and dying back. Before very long, this will just be grasses and not much else to see down here. But never mind, let's have a wander through and see what it's like. Oh, Eva, is it too boggy for you, Poppet? It's very wet underfoot and very boggy and I can see that some people have been through here already because their footprints are very evident in having broken through the frost layer. Anyway, let's keep going. It's very wet underfoot. See there, the sun is trying to peep out from behind those clouds up there. And despite it being frosty, it's not bitterly cold. So this is a damp sort of frost. It's been very moist air overnight, and there's probably been a relatively clear sky. And so we've got a frost, but my lips are not tingling. You know, it's fresh, but it's not unbearably cold. It's actually quite nice. It's quite refreshing to get out and walk in the cool morning air. Now here, this is interesting, isn't it? Because, because over here we've got frost, and then over here we have not. And it is just literally the shelter of those trees. Even though they have no leaves on them, they're just bare branches. They have created a microclimate here that means the frost has not formed on the leaves below. So isn't that interesting? That's a, an example of how 
in a garden you could even create a microclimate where slightly more tender plants would survive just because they're sheltered or overshadowed by something else that will just break up the frost as it falls. And you can see the line is actually quite abrupt where the frost ends and it has not formed on those nettles and brambles that are underneath the trees. Okay, I'm actually not going to head around that corner because I happen to know that it's very boggy around there and it's very wet and I think we'll probably get stuck in the mud and get in a right mess. So I'm just going to head up this hill now into the little copse. And I will have to be careful here as well because it's muddy here also. I'm going up a hill in slippery mud, not so easy. Here we can see one of these trees up here is a crab apple, or actually more likely some kind of feral apple. So somebody's probably thrown an apple core here when they've been walking, and it's grown into a feral apple tree that's producing these small and probably quite bitter apples. And there are loads of them down the bank there. Let's have a closer look. So down that bank, underneath the brambles there, there are piles of apples. And I think that's actually quite good because all of the little forest creatures, the, not this not, not this one, all of the little uh, woodland creatures, blackbirds especially, but also mice and other animals, will feed on these apples through the winter. Eva, come on, that's enough. No, come on, that's enough. You don't eat apples. You Come on, you're a dog. She does need reminding from time to time. So thanks for joining me on this very brief visit to the water meadow here, but I thought it was important really to have a look at it at this end of the year. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.